being long. We, we're we're going to finish chapter two tonight. Chapter two tonight of Mark. We, we've been in this series called The Church That Jesus Built, and we've been looking at the book of Mark as our blueprint for not only first century church ministry, but also for modern ministry, reconfiguring the church based on the teachings and the ministry of Jesus Christ. So last week we introduced a term called the priesthood of believers. This idea that with the veil being torn at crucifixion, everyone has access to God. And you don't have to have any titles, no hierarchy. Everybody has access to pray to God, to believe in God, and to, to, to communicate with God, and to get answers from prayer, and to interpret scripture from God. To tonight, and we ended last week with this thought right here. We ended last week that you must be open to straying away from tradition for transformation. When, when Jesus um, finished having this dinner with these sinners and tax collectors, Levi had led a whole new army to God, to, to Christ, who was now going to be witnesses because they felt love, right? Nobody else loved them or accepted them, but Jesus's invitation and Jesus showing up to where they were gave them access that they wouldn't have never that they wouldn't have gotten and tradition wouldn't have allowed sometimes you got to put tradition on the shelf so i want to introduce a new term tonight it's not a new term but i want to look at it in the the life of the rest of this narrative and this word is the word construct 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 is a noun and it's a verb so when you think about it in the form of a noun, a construct is an idea or theory containing various conceptual elements, typically one, typically one considered to be subjective and not based on empirical evidence. In other words, a construct is typically an opinion that somebody forms that they stand by. It's an opinion that becomes so strong, it becomes a practice. You know, in, in, in marriages, one of the major constructs is how you do the laundry, right? Because most people come to a marriage having constructed the way they do the laundry, whether they mix the colors or whether they separate lights and darks, right? Whether they wash the darks in cold water or warm water, whether they fold the towels in half and then in half, or whether they fold the towels in thirds or in four, I, you know, we, we all do it. And, and constructs, there really is no evidence for it. You just do what works for you until it becomes a practice, right? That's the first definition of construct. Second definition of construct is a physical thing, which is delib deliberately built or formed. So this idea then becomes a tradition or a construct because you deliberately put emphasis in it. Let, let me tell you what that looks like. White, white or European or American Christianity was built on this idea that Jesus was blonde hair, blue eye, blue eye. That, that's the construct. That, that Jesus loved for slavery. That was a construct that was built in American Christianity that was passed on to the slaves. In fact, they would read portions of the Bible that supported their ideas of slaves obey your master, right? For this is good, right? This is the will of God. And that was the construct that was built to support their practice. That's a noun. As a verb, construct means two things as well. It means to form an idea or theory by bringing together various conceptual elements, typically over a period of time. So again, it's a practice that has been believed to be true so long that it becomes a theory or an idea. Now, a theory is not a fact. A theory is something that's proven 
but it's proven because it's constantly practiced, right? Um, ugh, I don't want to get in deep, but I, I guess I might as well start deep and then swim my way to the shallow end. We talked about it with baptism, right? Different denominations, in fact, denominations have developed over ideas that were different from other denominations. One of those ideas and constructs being baptism, how it's done, right? Is it full immersion? Is it sprinkling? Is it done in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost? Or is it done in the name of Jesus? These constructs to construct means to form an idea over time. And it means to build or erect something, typically a building, road, or machine. But I would suggest that some of our traditions are more mausoleums and museums. They're, they're, they're often places where dead ideas stay and constantly are visited and celebrated. So some of our constructs. So when we think about it in terms of Christianity and what Jesus is doing, Jesus spent a lot of time deconstructing, tearing down traditional ideology, traditional thinking, traditional monuments or mausoleums that people were worshiping that weren't associated with Christ and Christ's plan. And we say that all the time. In fact, Elder Walker said it in a heartbeat that some of the stuff we hold true to ain't even Christ-like, right? Some of the stuff we put in place ain't got nothing to do with the Bible and what Jesus said, but we've done them so long that we, like, like, like gloves, right? The reason gloves were put in place in the American church, gloves were given to slaves so that slaves' fingerprints wouldn't be on the silver communion and the offering pans, that ushers, slaves were given the title of usher, but they were made to wear gloves because white folk didn't want black hands touching them. That's why gloves. The reason they covered the communion table was because there was no central air. And so they would, in hot months, flies would be around. So they would cover the communion table to prevent flies from getting on the bread. Right. But over time, we constructed it to be that communion had to be covered, even though we have central air. And for the most part, we don't have flies no more in the church. Right. So constructs are, are monuments based on ideas that aren't founded, but are believed and passed on generation to generation until they become tradition, right? I need y'all to understand that what Jesus does for the rest of this chapter is destroy constructs, all right? So, so, to, so to get started, I need somebody to open up and read for me Mark chapter 2, Mark chapter 2, and let's look at verses 18 through 22. The disciples of John and of the Pharisee were fasting. Then they came and said to him, why do the, why do the disciples of John and of the Pharisee fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, can the friend of a bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. But the day will come when the bridegroom will, take, will be taken away from them, and then they will fast in those days. No one sews a piece of unsunk cloth, cloth on an old garment, or else the new piece pulls away from the old, and the tear is made worse. And no one put new wine into an old wineskin, or else the new wine bursts the wineskin. 
the wine is spilled and the wine skin is ruined, but new wine must be put in the new wine skin. Woo, right? So the disciples, not the disciples, the Pharisees and the disciples of John are fasting. And they see that Jesus and his disciples aren't fasting, so they have a problem. And they begin to question what Jesus is doing. Here's the first thing you need to know. Change is difficult for anyone confined to a construct. Change is difficult. So if we say that tradition is a construct, anytime someone tries to do something new, it will be challenged because change is difficult for anyone who's confined to a construct, if that's tradition, right? Some of the biggest fights in churches are over things like the pictures on the wall, where the organ is placed, especially if somebody from the old church bought the organ, right? If somebody bought the pew, right? Who sits on the pew, right? My, my, my grandmama built this church. My grandmama bought this pew. The plaque is on the back of the pew. So, so change is difficult for anyone who is confined to a construct. The Pharisees were fasting. The disciples of John were fasting. Jesus wasn't fasting, so it became a problem for them because they were doing something that Jesus wasn't doing. It was different, and it had to be challenged because so many people simply want you to do what was always done, right? Now, that's the first thing, and we'll get a little bit more into that in just a second. Here's the second thing. We can't worry about doing what others are unsure of because we are different. We can't worry about doing what others are unsure of because we are different, right? It's, 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 Jesus wasn't bothered by their question. In fact, Jesus entertained them calmly by letting them know that when the bridegroom is with the keepers of the bridegroom with the with the with the groomsmen that you can't expect for them to be fasting right when the wedding's going on that's the message translation you don't fast when the cake is out you don't fast when the party's going on but when it's over there's a need for fasting right and we have to understand first of all this was important for the first century church because they'd already done something that was different from what was being done, right? They, they had confessed Christ. Nobody else had confessed Christ. Everybody else was cool with the status quo of Judaistic worship, but they were doing something different and they were called to be different. They were no longer Jews, they were in the way. That was the name of it, it wasn't the church. They were in the way, they were, they were the ecclesia, the called out. They were in the way. And so the, the disciples had to let the people know, listen, what you're doing is going to be different. And people who are confined to their traditional constructs are going to challenge you. But you got to remember what you're doing it for and, and the purpose you're doing it for. Remember, if you remember, and we'll find this out as we go through chapters 3 through 16, the Pharisees liked the control of determining who had access to Christ, no, no, who had access to the synagogue and to the traditional ways of Israel. Part of what the Pharisees loved was their control. But Jesus' command was to go into all the nations and teach. You can't go into new places doing old things especially thinking that the old ways is going to be the norm because you're going into places that aren't familiar with old ways. One of the things we often talk about for those of us who grew up in the church is how we have to look at things through the eyes of people 
who have never been to church. And we can't be condescending when they ask us questions, right? Why y'all do this? Why, 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 why? And we have to expect questions, especially in challenging our own constructs. Because here's the reality. I don't care how contemporary we say we are, or we think we are. We all have constructs, right? You see it in the simplest thing. How many of us, construct, you ready? How many of us, when we get money, want to make sure that the money is pointing in all the same direction, right? All, all the 20s are together, the 10s, we want them all to be the same way, right? We want them all to be facing. So we, we spend a whole lot of time shuffling them to make sure, right? People who, people who don't come from that construct and they never have money, they just want the money. You can ball it up, you right? We we straighten out our money, right? That's a construct, right? Um, cer certain banks, for instance, have a construct. Certain banks, when they look at transactions, they they separate transactions based on the largest transaction. So when they're doing their deductions, right? For those of us who still use the bank ledger, right? We just write them in based on date and we calculate based on date. Banks, especially over the weekend, some banks calculate based on the largest transactions. So if you had a $500 withdrawal and you had a dollar withdrawal, they're going to do the $500 first, then they're going to do the $1 construct we don't think the same way all the time and many of us have gotten into bank dilemmas because the way they calculate we don't calculate then we wondering why they service charges why why this 36 dollar charge right and then we get really mad because the way they did it the little stuff never even made it in right okay maybe that's that's not us right but those constructs are in place and we have to, when we're thinking about tradition as it relates to doing ministry, too many of us, especially other ministries, simply want a new name, but an old practice, right? They get mad. Jerusalem, they get mad with the pastor. So then they launch New Jerusalem Baptist Church. But New Jerusalem Baptist Church operates from the same bylaws as old Jerusalem, right? New greater Mount Pisgah, but they do the same stuff as regular Mount Pisgah, right? Because they are oftentimes confined to the construct and they worry about doing stuff different. Jesus says, listen, you need to understand that we aren't y'all. So while y'all may fast, we aren't fasting because we don't have need to fast because I'm present with them right now. Okay, okay. Here's the next thing. Many feel the only way is the way it was always done. Many feel, right? The Pharisees and the disciples of John said, this is how we've always done it. Why aren't you doing it like this? Because part of constructs and the monuments that are built through constructs is the idea that there is only one way. In fact, um, Tom Rayner from Lifeway in his book, um, 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 Autopsy, of a dead church or a dying church says that the, the, the seven last words of any dead anything is we've always done it this way, right? That, that suggests this idea that God can only move in one way. Now, I think the amazing imagery of this is the centurion who came to Jesus saying, my servant is sick. In fact, some 
gospel say he didn't come, but he sent his servants to tell Jesus. If Jesus only healed one way, then Jesus would have had to go to the centurion's house and touch, right? Because based on Mark 2, Mark 1, the first way he healed was to lay hands on Peter's mother-in-law. But the centurion said, I know how people like you who are in control and in command work. You just have to speak a word. And I, I don't know if anybody on this will testify. I'm so glad God don't heal in just one way. I'm so glad God doesn't deliver and set free in just one way. I'm, God, I'm glad that God's grace, as my grandma would say, suits my case. Oh, I'm so glad that God meets me at my need and handles my situation individually, right? Many, many believe, and you gotta be careful about those that want to control the way God moves in your life. That's really what I believe the disciples were saying was because we're about to go, right? Prophetically, they were already knowing that this dispersion was gonna take place. And evidence of how God moves is that Paul didn't just write one letter to one church. Paul wrote letters that were tailor-made to meet the needs of each of the churches Paul was writing to. The way Paul addressed Corinth was not the way Paul addressed Ephesus. And the way Paul addressed Ephesus was not a way, the way Paul addressed Philippi or Galatia or, or Colossae right? God, Paul understood that each ministry operated independently. And there's no one size fits all. And what we have to do is we have to work for what works best for us, right? That's why we're constantly in the drawing board. That's why we're constantly making improvements. That's why... <laughs> Uh, Lady B tells me all the time, right? When you're making these ideas and you're talking to God, you're not trying to duplicate anything that was done other places. You're trying to make a system that works for us, knowing what we have, our strengths and our weaknesses. Pastor B. Yes, sir. Let me ask you this question then, uh, because I, I, I'm, I'm believing that. I was aware of what you was trying to present pertaining to outreach. Um, because you were always, it, I will always listen to the things that you say, you would throw little nibbits out there, you know, pertaining of uh, how we're operating or not to be confined just to the things that we did do. Not that you wanted to abandon. However, you wanted us to be able to look much broader or look at it from an aspect of, you can, you can serve in many different facets where we are. You know, I, I never, I never took the aspect of you wanted us not to do the outside events, but I believe that what you were saying to me periodically over over the year, uh, you would throw different hints at me. You know, and and I and I, I took heed to it. You know, I I, I tried to figure out. Uh, Pastor B is trying to tell me something uh, or, or, or my mindset to be more broader. And, and, and I can truly say that it's, it's like it's coming to influition as of today, the things that we are doing, you know, and it's, it's a learning process too, mm -hmm. in, in aspect of it. So I think I, I got a good idea in, in what you are, are, are talking about because uh, I'm looking at it from the outreach perspective as well as you had pointed out. I think that's it, right? I think that 
What Jesus was saying to them was don't get caught up in thinking this is the only way it can be done, right? Open yourself up to other possibilities that don't take away from the intent, still gets the, the mission done, but they're, oh, I'm ahead of myself. Ooh, you're making me good ahead of myself. You're two points ahead of me, Sharp. But the, the idea is we're still practicing. We just don't practice based on your timeline or your concern or your control, right? Um, if you notice, and, and, and you know, if you notice, we don't necessarily do communion every first Sunday, right? We do it as the spirit leads. Right? Jesus says, as often as you do it, I think tradition has made us think in several circuits, right, that it can only be done on a certain day, only be done in a certain way, right, only can be done a certain, a certain dress, right, but when you look at it, J Jesus and his disciples in the upper room, they ain't had the same color necktie on, in fact, they ain't even had no suits on, right, they, they, they didn't have a pre-planned table set up with a cover on it. Jesus was in the middle of eating dinner and decided to teach at the end of dinner based on what was left on the table, right? The dinner rolls and the wine that were left, the unleavened bread, right? The bread and the, right? But he could have chose any way to do it, right? John's gospel adds an element that wasn't in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, which was the washing of the feet. It threw, it threw Paul off, I mean, Peter off. You ain't washing my feet. But it adds an element of servitude because that's what Jesus wanted to do to show that he honored them. Now, we haven't done a foot washing ceremony, but there are many that do it all the time. I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but again, Jesus' intent to do it might not necessarily have been to make it a repeated occurrence because if that was the case, Jesus might have done it multiple times, but he didn't. He did it in that moment to demonstrate. And I think part of tradition and, and part, yeah, part of tradition is because we don't understand a thing, we construct our idea about a thing and make it necessary. I really don't believe John and the Pharisees understood why they were fasting, but they, they started practicing fasting. That, that's why we, we haven't, we did it a couple of times, but I haven't called a Daniel's fast, right? Because in order to do a Daniel's fast, you got to understand the purpose of it. A lot of people just do it, but they don't understand why Daniel did it. Daniel was resisting oppression. Daniel said, listen, I'm not going to defy. I want to prove to you that the God we serve is, is in control of our health. So why, while it may be an honor for some to eat from the king's table, I'm going to say, look, just give us what's grown and some water, right? If you give us what's grown and what's from water, we'll prove to you that the power don't come from the king's table. The power comes from God. And 10 days later, the first time, right? 21 days later, the second time, they were stronger and better apt to do the work. Not, eat, not because they did the practice repeatedly, but because they were taking a stance against the empire to prove to the empire that the king had no, that Nebuchadnezzar had no power. God had all power. So when we do things, Right? We got to understand the, uh, the intent of the original act of it. Right? And we, we, don't, we don't just need to do, because part of the danger of tradition is you do it so much, you don't even know why you do it. And you become doing it and making, uh, demanding other people do it, especially new people who really have no education about it at all. You just making them do it. Right, Keisha's, Keisha's, Keisha's cousin, Nicole, came one day. And Nicole sat in the back. And I looked up and she had a lap scarf on her, right? And I asked Keisha, right? Keisha got mad at me. She ain't gonna say she got mad, but she, you know, she gets mad with a smile. I, I love that about her. 
right? But Ke I asked Keisha, I said, Keisha, did you make her put the scarf on? When she came in, did you throw it on her? She said, no, she asked for it. Because there's a big difference because the old church would force you to have it on without explaining why, right? Without explaining why. And it often became an offensive act when we were trying to correct, but we really had no reason to say why. Go ahead, Doc. I was, you know, talk. well, yeah, I'm gonna piggyback about the lap scarf. You know, a lot of times, and that's true because the old mothers, especially when the young ladies to come in with the short shorts or if their skirt didn't reach, you know, a certain criteria, they'll put the lap scarf on, but they didn't never question. No one never questioned. They just got offended about, well, why are you putting this scarf on me? And I think there's nothing wrong with asking questions. And to be honest with you, um, it's good to do that because the lap scarf is for protection because you got some men ain't delivered. So and that could be a distraction if, if, if you don't have the scarf on them or the, the cover, even, or even when um, you work in an altar where people may come for prayer and they, their, their clothes may not be properly, um, well, for church purposes, it could be a distraction too. So sometimes they'll cover them up, but yeah, but it's good to be explained that because people could be distracted, even including the man of God or the woman of God or vice versa. That's why, um, you know, it's good to have those things in place because I mean, although people are going to come in and, and we're not going to judge them, but we do have to make sure that um, they're, that they're covered in a way. So they won't have, a, they won't bring a lot of attention to themselves and they won't distract nobody. Either. So I, I do see why they do that, but it's good to explain why they cover you. So people won't get offended because if you just, if I just walk in and you just put a scarf on somebody or you cover them up, it could be offensive. Yeah, I definitely believe that explanation must be done and inquiry, right? Because here's the thing, right? And Bay, I see your hand. I'm, I'm, I'm going to get to you just a second. Um, the amazing, the amazing thing about when people here dress to impress or come to church, for those who are in church, they have one idea. But for those who are only our, our whether it's CME, Christmas, Mother's Day, Easter, right? Those that only come, they are dressing in their best, right? They don't spend time to find shoes and dress that coordinate. And for some, they do want the attention of being seen in the place because they haven't been there. But again, explanation and compassion must be demonstrated. And I think that, that in, in contemporary places, it is up to those who are in positions to guide, for instance, ushers and greeters, to make sure if by chance their hallelujah and Lord have mercy will be shown when they sit down, that they get seated in a row where it won't be shown. Right, don't march them to the front row if, if, if that's right, and explain to them why. And if they come, then part of the altar time must be the expl explanation of leadership that listen, while you're up here, we're going to have altar workers that are going to cover you, right? To cover you, right? So that you're not exposed. Because in the spirit, you might not be aware. And to protect you, that's what we're doing. Rather than just throwing a sheet on them, because in it might mean something different in the sheet in the street, right? For you to just throw a sheet on. My, I have a student that they threw something over his head and started fighting him. So if a person comes with that trauma to the church and you throw a sheet on them without explaining, they may get up swinging. And then deacon and 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 sister so and so who's just trying to do the best they could end up with bloody nose and stuff. Go ahead, babe. Wow. <laughs> um, when y'all were saying about the lap scarf um, or skirt, I thought about that's why it's important 
that you don't just throw any and everybody on the usher board. And that's the purpose of usher training. It's not that, you know, when we go into training that someone's trying to make you do anything. You should be willingly want to serve when you get on the usher board. And me personally, I didn't like ushering when Joe was ushering. Because I felt like I was going to be a reflection of him. And he laughed too much. And I took ushering seriously. <laughs> but, you know, he still did a good job where people were still, you know, personable with him. And, you know, he could, I guess, be the icebreaker with his ushering. But I was, um, I, I, I got trained a little bit by um, Sister Fee. So I had that tunnel vision that, you know, I got to stick to the protocol. Make sure you ain't got no water bottle drinking in the in the, in the sanctuary, make sure you got that lap skirt, make sure you ain't chewing nothing where people can hear you chewing, tap them on the shoulder. I took my ushering seriously. I love it. I love it. I love it. Go ahead, Pastor Di. B. Oh. Go ahead. Pastor B, you know, I, I wrestle with that. Uh, and here's what I wrestle with. I wrestle with how back in the day, if you had water in the sanctuary, they will look at you as if you, as if you committed an abomination. Do we have any <laughs> scripture to validate the back of those type of traditions? Because you couldn't have water in the sanctuary. You couldn't have this in the sanctuary. And I just want to know, was it a sin? Because, I mean, for years, and I don't chew gum in church because, you know, I just, you know, I don't chew gum in church, but I'm not going to sit back if somebody was to have a water bottle in the sanctuary. I, I just can't sit back and condemn them or, or send them to hell or, or make it seem like that they're sinning. Where, where did that come from? I, I don't know the origin, right? I think it's the sacredness of the sanctuary. But I, I was I was like you until I went to churches where they drink coffee in the sanctuary. I, I've been in some churches, they wear hats in the sanctuary. I think that 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 your freedom in God should allow you to be free. Um, I know that it's not everybody's practice, but the, the damage or the danger is making the sanctuary more holy than God, right? Anytime you idolize something to such a degree you or, or, or protect it to such a degree, you, you could potentially make the sanctuary more holy than the God of the sanctuary, right? Um, and and that's, that's a constant wrestle and those are confines and, and constructs that have been in place, right? Um, my mama used to make me, um, when I was little, she, she used to, she used to, it used to be grape juice in the bottle. I think it was a grape juice bottle, but I think she drank, I drank all the grape juice and she refilled it with water. And I think one day as a child, I think it rolled on the floor under the pews. And I, I remember I had on a white, a white outfit. I think it was the second Easter outfit because the first year was pants, but the second year was shorts. And I, I don't know how that happened, but I ended up crawling all under the pew, right, in my white outfit. And I remember getting in trouble, but it, it wasn't necessarily for drinking because I was a child, but it wasn't, but it was because the water then became a distraction, right? That like the gum chewing, smacking, popping the gum, it becomes a distraction, right? So, so whatever the, the idea is to keep worship so focused. Ooh, that's, that's a segue. I see you, uh, Sister Minister Carrie. Let, let me say that, and I saw you, Karen. You know what else is a distraction in worship? And this ain't got, you don't even bring this in. Well, you do your mouth, right? If we really be serious, a lot of times the sidebar conversations are distractions in worship. Right. One of the things we tried to do to limit that was to start off this worship and prayer as a sign from faith school that when you come in into the sanctuary, the conversation cease. Because it may not be distraction to you because you want to hear what the person's saying, but to someone standing on the pulpit and watching the people to kind of gauge what's going on, it is distraction. Worse than gum. Worse than a short dress. Right? What worse than a bottle of water? It is distraction, right? So I think that those are things that were put in place. Go ahead, Karen. Good evening, everybody. 
Um, I think I was just going to go back to what um, Sister Bay said about, um, I guess, posture with ushering and helping those to understand. And she mentioned when she said that, it made me think about that's the whole purpose of why we have the different spiritual gift assessments, the place assessment that you're going to do, because if you don't have the temperament and if you don't have the personality and you are ushering, I remember when I was, my dad first had me up ushering and the lady who was teaching me, she was mean and hard and cold to everybody who came to the door but yet we're supposed to be greeting and ushering everybody in and so I just think that that marries with the idea of if we're going to um, train those who are greeting especially particularly the women who are coming in and explaining the purpose and the necessity for the lap clock we have to have the personality and we have to show Christ and we still have to say what needs to be said in a way that it needs to be said but then the question behind that is am i at the right place am i in the right ministry place to be serving in that area so that it comes comes off the way it needs to come off yeah yeah go ahead Dan. it has to be it has to be in love you know i i, I think that a lot of people wouldn't be a fit wouldn't be as offended if we present it in love, like the lap scarf, or if somebody was chewing gum in church, or whatever the case may be. I think that we come off as so harsh, and we get and we forget the fact that that they people ain't talk to us like that. They ain't say they. I mean, I mean, it's a way how you talk to people. Dr. Nita said something so profound. She said this, um, uh, uh, some years ago, she says, it's not what you say, it's how you say it. Mm -hmm. So it's the way how you say things that can make someone receive it in a way. I mean, yeah, um, put a lap scarf or, okay, no eating in the sanctuary or no talking in the sanctuary during worship, but yelling across the pulpit and saying, telling everybody to be quiet, we're about to have church. That's not the way how you do things. There's a way how you do it. And I think that people will receive it if it's presented or if it's said better and said in love, they'll receive it. Yeah, I love it, I love it. Mr. Carey, you had a comment? Yeah, I sort of did because by me being an usher uh, ever since I was at Word of Faith, I, um, I see changes that should be made now anyway because um, Sometimes ushers can be so rigid and so unapproachable. I mean, if you if I'm gonna come in a place and there are greeters at the door, I expect the greeters to be cheerful, welcoming, and all of that. But if they're sitting up there looking like a soldier or something standing at ease, um, you know, it 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 can kind of turn people off. So as a trainer of the little kids um that was under me when I was um, ushering and still like ushering. I um, try to let them, you know, be more outgoing, more cheerful. And as far as the thing with the lap scarf, I always had a, a plan for that. If they came in with a mini dress, and I know Jesus said, come as you are and all that, they don't understand. I just put them in another seat, not on the front row. I mean, you just skirt them around to another seat. And, and if people come enough and all of that, you're going you're gonna to feel kind of condemned or condemnation, whatever you might want to call. Um, and certain things you're just not going to wear. You just, you're not going to do it once you really find out the purpose. So this is what, um, it goes back to what something like Elder Dial was saying. It's, it's not what you say, it's the way you say it. But it's not what you do, it's how you do it. So, um, I think it's it's a good change too, you know. Yeah. I love it. I love it. I love it. Thank you. Thank you all. All right. Here's the next thing. Some customs are indeed only currently necessary based on individual conditions. Some customs are indeed only currently necessary based on individual conditions. Jesus told him, listen. Y'all don't have me with you, so you need to fast. But my disciples have me with them currently. 
So the fasting is not necessary. When you think about that, it's the, it's the idea for the first century church that practices need to constantly be evaluated to see if they're still necessary, right? Everything needs to constantly be in a state of evaluation, right? To see what is currently needed because everything that was custom may not need to be used currently, right? Some things that we used to do based on where we are now, we won't do ever again, right? They, they've run their course, their season is over, right? For instance, we won't ever, well, not ever, because Karen still loves the baby grand, but we won't ever have a non-electronic piano or organ, something that doesn't plug in. I mean, it worked before there were electric keyboards, but now we have electric keyboards, it would be silly of us to go back to, right? We won't ever go back to an unmiked system, right? Where there's no microphone and we're just talking from the pulpit. Why? Because we're now engaging in multiple levels of ministry and multiple platforms. It would be silly of us to limit ourselves. By going with COVID, we won't ever put pews back in the church because of the multi-uses of the sanctuary. So some stuff was good in that moment, but as times change, we have to change with the time, right? Pandemic has forced us to make changes and is still forcing us to make changes, right? We, we added a ramp because Minister Herod has a call and she ain't preaching from the floor. So we added a ramp, wasn't a ramp before, but now based on our current needs, there's gonna be a ramp. Ah, this is rough. Oh, this is a rough one, I'm about to say this. And I'm saying this on here, it's recorded, golly. Okay, I'm gonna say it. Pause the recording real fast, Vanique. Right? Nothing can be called new with old commitments or confined to old constructs. You can't call anything new if it's confined to old constructs. A new car, a new house is, is not the same as a renovated house or a refurbished. A refurbished computer may be new to you, but it's not new, right? Verse, verse 21, and I love it in the, I think I love verse 21 in the message translation, right? In the message translation, let me tell you what it says. It says, he went on, no one cuts up a fine silk, silk scarf to patch old work clothes. You want fabrics that match and you don't put your wine in cracked bottles, right? You, you, you can't say it's new and then confine it. That's what I was talking about with churches that say they knew Jerusalem and knew Gethsemane and knew this, but they do all the same practices, right? You, you have to be understanding that new means new. New also means may never have been seen. So there is a difference between a model and a prototype. A model is a copy of something that currently exists. A prototype is the first of that model, right? So the model, oftentimes people want to follow a model of ministry, but they say they're doing a new thing. Sometimes the reason it's uncomfortable in doing a new thing is because there's never seen it. It's never been done. So you are doing what is called a prototype. And prototypes often get criticized because it is often out of a person's understanding because oftentimes our understanding is built on what we've already seen. Paul says it like this, 
in Romans, mm -mm, in Ephesians 3 and 20. Now unto him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all we can ask or think, right? So if we can ask it or think it, it's modeled. But God does exceedingly and abundantly beyond that. God does prototype. God does, and I think one of the challenges is that is even in scripture. When, when in Isaiah 43, 18, 19, I believe, when it says God is forgetting the former things, God is going to do a new thing. That's what Isaiah said. But the word God, the word Isaiah used in that word new meant reformed, out of existing stuff. And I believe Isaiah said that word out of existing stuff and not create, but form is because even Isaiah couldn't fathom the idea of new because new had only come before Isaiah's existence, right? The only time new was done was in Genesis one when God barad, God created out of nothing, something. And oftentimes we, have an inability in our own power of thinking new. In fact, <laughs> when I ask people to give me new ideas, oftentimes what their ideas are, are things they've seen done other places, right? So they're new to us, but they're not new, right? And I'm not knocking new to us. Don't think I'm knocking new to us. I'm just saying, that sometimes in new constructs and destroying tradition, you must be willing to do things new, new to us and new to everybody else and be able to stand on the criticism that comes from everybody else because they've never seen it done. In, 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 in 2017, God gave me the vision for the Life Center, which was a completely cyber ministry right? No buildings, everything online through Facebook Live and YouTube. From 2017 to 2020, Pastor, um, what's his name, from New Ebenezer in Florence used to laugh at me, right? Every, every time he saw me, he, 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 he was, well, never mind, but he, he used to laugh at me. Why, well, how you, how you doing that? How you know who your members are, how, how are you tracking? I'd give them, you know, fact, that's just so silly. They need to come into a building till March 16, 2020, when God shut buildings down, right? Right, God shut buildings down, right? But in my, in my fear of going against my constructs, I let his conversation stifle the full potential of what I did, right? And, and, and for several reasons, right? God probably didn't allow it because if I did that, I would have never been open to anything else. But I was so far ahead of the preparation for online because I'd been doing it for three years, right? And it's so amazing that people will never understand new. That's what the disciples of John and, and, and the Pharisees were saying, oh, what do you mean you're not fasting? That's just something we do. And Jesus had to say, look, don't nobody take old new cloth and attach it to old cloth. Nobody don't take new wine and pour it in old wine skins. That's ridiculous, right? But in their minds, that was the only way to do it because that's how they've always done it. Here, here's the next thing. Oh man, 835, doggone it. Time leaves us so quickly. New ministry requires new methods and new materials. I just touched on it. Here's the thing. There is a cost to choosing not to conform to constructs. There is a cost. I need to say this, and I think I'll end here. I wanted to go on, but I'll end here because we got to get done. There is a cost to not conforming. In order to not cut up silk to patch, 
You got to be willing to buy new garments. In order to not put new wine in old wineskins, you got to be willing to buy new wineskins. In order to be able to stand up to the ideology and traditions that are in place, you got to be confident and bold enough to stake your claim that this is what we're going to do. It costs. It costs rejection by many. It costs questioning by those who are confused. It costs challenges by those who think they have control over the way you do it. And it costs money to do it effectively. There's a cost. And part of the reason so many people conform to the construct is conforming to the construct is easy. And it's costless, costless. Because ain't nobody challenging you if you're doing it the way they always did it. And ain't nobody questioning your spirituality. Ain't nobody questioning your Jesus if you do it the way they always did it. But if you step out and do it in a different way, you got to be ready to pay the cost. That's heavy. Because some of us don't like to pay the cost. It costs. It costs. Let me, let me, ooh, I guess I'll go here since we're talking about cost. It costs, right? It costs to do things differently. It costs to do ministry. And the way we've always done it. I remember, I remember talking to when I was in the finance, the, the new members class at Mount Zion in Arlington, the deacon talked to us and he said he remember he was in the military. He remembered that he'd come to church and he'd give a crisp hundred dollar bill. And he thought he was doing something. He was a military officer and he'd bring a crisp hundred dollar bill and he, with pride, he'd hold it out and put it in the basket and walk away thinking he was doing something until he researched what tithing was and realized that tithing was a tenth and realized that when he would bring on his paycheck days twice a month, that hundred dollar bill and lay it in the offering as an officer, a major in the military, that he was telling God that I discount all the other money you gave me, but $1,000. And that's what I honor you for. I don't honor you for my real salary. I honor you for the hundred dollars. And he was convicted at that moment because he realized that his construct got in the way of what God was really calling for him to do. It costs to do ministry. It costs, and you have to take the cost of even being challenged yourself. Conviction is often the cost of doing new ministry. Conviction. When you have to look face to face with God, knowing God knows, and you have to wrestle with, am I really honoring God? Or and I, am I honoring the tradition that I believe was what was supposed to be done? That's rough. That's rough. But it's a cost in doing ministry. Dog, we ain't getting no farther. We're done. I'm stopping right there. That's the end of chapter, verse number 22, verse number 21, verse number 20, whatever it is. It's verse number 22, right? We'll pick up there. Um, second week in June. Next week is family time because it's the first Thursday in June, right? But I need us to understand that what Jesus was teaching and demonstrating to the Pharisees and the disciples of John and what the apostles were teaching to the first century church is that there is a cost of discomfort that comes from doing ministry. Your friends may turn their back on you because you worship in Jesus. Why you ain't going to the synagogue at the hour of prayer? Why you ain't doing things the way you used to do them? Because I'm different now. I serve different. I believe different. I've experienced different. And I have to be so dedicated to the different in order to be true to the God who allowed the different to take place. Any questions? Y'all start giving. Any questions? 
Uh, I don't know whether this is a question. It may be just a statement. Back in the day when before women were wore pants or slacks or whatever to church uh, freely, uh, I wore a pants suit to my church. This was when I was before I met your dad. Okay, and my uh, my mentor said, "Baby, you know you don't wear pants to church." You, you're supposed to give God your best. And I said, yes, ma'am. So, <laughs> um, but what she didn't know was that pantsuit was the most expensive thing I had. That was my best. Okay, fast forward to today. You have an unchurched young lady and she's coming to church for the first time and she is giving God her best. But her best is six inch heels, mini um, cleavage, but this is her best because it's the most expensive thing she's got. And she goes to church and she goes in and an usher meets her and throws something over her. Now, if she were me, I'm sorry, but I would not go back. I'd stay that Sunday, but I would not go back to that particular church. But on the other hand, I probably would do some research and maybe ask the lady why. And maybe she would explain to me and she would tell me, you know, she might just take me under her wings and say, baby, you know what? I'm gonna put this over you now, but after church, let's talk. Maybe. Anyhow, giving your best, the best that you have, your best and somebody, what they, it's, I don't know. I guess I'm, I'm just kind of <laughs> stuck processing. in the mud right here. Huh? Are you processing. Yeah. But anyway, that, that's my thing. It's, it's, um, and I guess it's that usher, it's left to the usher. That's how it's, what, how it has to be a person who feels. Yeah. When, when, uh, we, when, we, when we say give, give you, give, this is uh, uh, Dick and Garland, when we say giving our best, how about, uh, are, are, we, are we talking about physically or are we talking about giving giving our best from our heart right right that's what i would think from our heart that's what i would think you know i mean physically it doesn't matter you know when we when, when come to come to church i right. i believe that we as is if we we say come when you say come as you are yeah exactly. we're, we're coming we're coming yeah, you know, you and giving stuff wearing gucci louis you know <laughs> uh, that matter we should come, come without uh, best stuff. Your best, right? Your best, your best, your best work. Like your best, all you know, giving your all to it. You know, right, right. But an unchurched person, a person who's never been there, is going to give what they have, what they feel is their best. They're going to come, their and it's best. their best. It's their, their best. best. I, I believe. Yeah. I believe. I also believe this. And this, this Walker, you you can call me later and counsel me. I believe that part of <laughs> I believe that part of what the problem often was is the people that got covered were wearing it better than the people who were covering, right? I believe that, that some of it was it triggered something in the people that were covering and made them feel some kind of way, right? It it didn't bother the people wearing it, but the people who were watching it, it bothered them. And so they put these rules in place because it might have bothered them. Because sister so-and-so at the door might not be able to wear a six inch red bottom no more, right? She got to have on the usher shoe. So she might say, oh no, go ahead, babe. I just thought about when I was working at a um, auto parts store, high gear. I had a manager tell me that I could never have my own shop or store because people would look at two or three signs and wouldn't buy nothing. They walk out because when I was working at the store, people would pay the counter, and I literally put a sign on the counter and said, "Don't pay the counter, pay my hand," and I took that seriously, like. If I hand you your money, can you hand me the money you're giving me? <laughs> and he told me, he said, you cannot have your own shop because you would have signs posted up, the do's and the don'ts. 
and nobody would buy nothing. And that's how I feel about church. Sometimes you have to have things in writing for some people, not everybody, but some people literally need to see protocol in writing, even if you post it in the bathroom. That's good. That's good. That, that, that allows, right? That allows choice, right? Because if church is a place of choice, right? And you're finding a church that works for you. Like there's a church down the street from my home church that has coming in, no gum chewing, no nothing. So I've never been inside the church. Not that I chew gum, but just in case I ain't got no mint candy and my mouth is a little tart and I want to put a piece of gum in my mouth. I know that's not the place for me to worship because I'm going to have to be stink mouth the whole time because I can't chew gum there. But because I know that, I now have the choice to choose that that's not the place for me. But I also wonder about how many unchurched, unprepared, how many people miss, because God ain't say never said nothing about chewing gum, right? That was a practice because people didn't want to scrape gum off the pews after service, right? That was a practice of convenience for the people in the church. But how many of us make judgments and decisions about what's comfortable for us without being considerate about the people who are coming instead of making it comfortable for them? When you have guests, some people set their thermostat on what they like, regardless of their guests. But others ask their guests what temperature is comfortable for you, and they adjust the thermostat for their comfort. We have to choose whether we're going to have set thermostat or whether we are going to adjust our thermostat for the convenience of those who are coming until they build a tolerance for the thermostat setting that we have. All right, good discussion. Good discussion, good discussion. Good discussion. Next week is Thursday, and I want y'all to get, if, well, depending on the pollen level, I want y'all to get outside next Thursday. And I want you to, I want you, July, June is, is June Black Music Month? I think June is Black Music Month, right? So for the month of June, for June, I, I want you to share your favorite song with the people you're with, right? I want you to share your favorite song or album, right? Mama, I want you to dust off the favorite album daddy has of yours. It's two. One is Aretha Franklin's Amazing Grace, that album. I love that album because that has uh, You Got a Friend. Ooh, when you're down and oh, I like that thing. I like that. It's Bridge Over Troubled Water mixed with a You Got a Friend. I love that, right? And then he got a Tina Turner on the Real to Real, a live concert with Tina Turner. I might have to come and dust that off. You, you might not know Tina Turner. Uh, Minister Armwood, that that might be before your time, but but you gotta you got you gotta dust that off. <laughs> but but I want you to I want you to listen with the person you love. Your favorite music. It's Black Music Month, and I want us to experience Black Music Month in its fullest for next Thursday. Thursday, you you find that album, Sharp. Dust off them them DJing skills, and you and you and Sister Deborah, y'all y'all play songs in the key of life for y'all, for each other. But you can't play no Bobby Brown for him, babe. <laughs> you, 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 we want you to make it to the bowling thing. That, that Thursday come before the bowling event. We want you to make it to bowling so you can't play no Bobby Brown. Yeah, Bay and, Bay and Joe, like, don't wake me. I'm drinking. <laughs> Well, yeah, that's our theme song. New but Bobby Jack, gets New some good ones. <laughs> New Jack City. Don't wake me, I'm dreaming. Don't wake me, Christopher Williams. Yep, light skin Christopher. That's, yeah, that's, that's, not, that's our theme song. <laughs> Pretty, you know. <laughs> I might go watch New Jack City tonight. Yeah, yeah. All right, listen. I love y'all. Thank y'all for the dialogue. Ivan, tell your passenger, thank him for the input. Tell him thank you. And he's always welcome to rock with us in conversation.
Yeah. But he, he is right here. You hear telling yourself. Thank you. Thank you. Listen, Ivan going to give you a card with our contact information and Zoom ID. You rock with us anytime you want to, man. Bring your conversation right, thank you. to the square. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. Yeah, it's in that back seat. Okay. Amen. Amen. Has Ivan heard from his brothers? No. Okay. We're still praying. Pray. Okay. We'll do. We're still praying. We're still praying. Rochelle, will you close us out in prayer? Yes, sir. Father God, thank you for allowing us to come together on one accord. Thank you for giving us another day to get it right. Thank you for keeping us in good health and strength. We ask that you comfort those that are grieving many losses tonight, Lord. We ask that you wrap your loving arms around the whole world. For there are many loved ones who are grieving uh, losses, not just due to the shootings, Lord, but we're still losing people to COVID. We're still losing people to cancer and many other illnesses, Lord. We ask that you go by the hospitals, Lord, and give the patients healing, whether it's on this side or the other, Lord. We ask that you renew our strength. We ask that you allow us to have a love and a word of kindness for someone to bring them through the day the way you would bring us through so that we can continue to bring people to your kingdom. I ask that you bless the shepherd and the first lady of this house and renew their strength and bless all the members and saints and clergy assembled under the sound of my voice that we may be excellent in the mission that you set before us, Lord. Continue to shine on us like only you can. In Jesus Christ's mighty name we pray, amen. Amen, amen. Listen, love y'all. Y'all have an amazing night. Um, amen.